In Joshua chapter 2, 9 to 11, we see that God had brought the children of the children of Israel, the Israelites, out of Egypt and into the promised land. These children of Israel had experienced many miraculous events, and it was their time to get what belonged to them, but they were afraid. You see, God had brought them out of Egypt. He had brought them into the promised land. They had experienced all of these miraculous events. They knew that it was time for them to get what had belonged to them, but fear was somehow crippling them. And so Joshua decides that he would send two spies to count out the land of Jericho, that promised land and the surrounding area. So he asked them to go overlook the land and then bring back a report to him, information, any information for that matter that was useful. So it was during the investigation of those two spies that they decided that they were going to take things up to the next level and they would visit the house of Rahab, which everybody knew at the time was a prostitute. The king of Jericho heard about these two men who had come into the city and he sends out his officers to Rahab who demands that Rahab give up these two men. Rahab resists the command of the king and he, she did not turn in the two men and instead she hid them as we know on the top of her roof, the roof of her house, and tells the officers at the door that the men had already left. In fact, she said, you know what? These men were probably well beyond the gates of the city, and the only way for you to catch them is to go after them right now before they get a little too far. The truth is, at that time, in the country of Jericho, right there in their place, Rahab's city was in crisis. Rahab must have also been in a crisis business-wise because I'm absolutely sure business has slowed down because everyone was on quarantine on the inside of the walls of Jericho. And Rahab was now looking for a pact for her future beyond the walls. So Rahab goes up to the roof to speak to these two spies and she mentions to them that all the people in Jericho were fearful of the God of Israel. She said, they have heard how he brought the children of Israel out of Egypt, how he had crushed the Egyptians in the Red Sea, how he had given them victory over the enemies and all the people in Jericho, all of the people in my country, all of the people in my place are melting in fear because of the God of the Israelites. She then lets these two men out through her window which was on the town wall, and then makes a special request of them. She actually asked them to do her a favor. She said to them, I have spared your life. I have acted kindly toward you. So I am asking a favor of you that you would spare my life. You would save my life and the life of my family when the Israelites attack Jericho. So the spies said, no problem. Our life for your life your life for our life. So the spies gives Rahab a crimson thread that they said to her, you need to hang that from your window. They told her that everybody, because she specifically asked for my mom, my dad, my brothers, my sisters, and everyone who belonged to them to be saved. They said to her, gather everyone that you want saved or spared and bring them into her home. Bring them into your home. In fact, as long as they stay in this home, in your doors, right here in this house, they will be spared from the wrath that was to come. And if by chance blood runs through the streets of Jericho, you and your family, anyone who's in this house, they will be spared. So just imagine the entire country, the entire city was in quarantine. The entire place was on lockdown. No one was going in and no one was going out. That is why essentially she had to smuggle the men in and out. The people within the walls of Jericho were not afraid of a virus. They were not afraid of COVID-19. They were not afraid of a flu. They were afraid of the children of Israel and their God. So now the spies returned to Joshua and he told them, they told him in, in fact, that the land was theirs for the taking because the people feared the Israelites and their God. 
So something interesting was happening within the walls of Jericho. So there was this current crisis that was crippling the, the, the people within the walls of Jericho in fear. The folks on the inside, the Bible tells us, they were, these people were so afraid that they began to stock up on food. They were well prepared. They gathered food from spring and they were gathering their harvest. They had a bunch of food supply. In fact, some commentaries say they had these large jars of grain that were found in their houses. And it suggested that the inhabitants of Jericho could have held out for perhaps several years since their people did not historically consume a lot of grain, but they had it piled up. They had so much in stock because they wanted to stay safe within the walls of Jericho, almost like the Israelites would have virus. They would stay within their walls until the children of Israel would disappear. But in the midst of all of that madness, in the midst of the crisis and the fear and the stockpiling, Rahab was on a journey. Rahab was seeking God. Today we're, we're focusing on prayer. Rahab was seeking God at a time when others were fearful, stockpiling, and waiting for the crisis to be over. So what can we learn from Rahab's story and Rahab in the midst of that crisis? One of the things that we can learn from her is that Rahab did not feel secure within the walls of Jericho. She did not feel safe at home. We are in a world where for many countries, maybe not the US as much, but for many countries in the world, people were stuck in lockdown for months. They could not go out unless they were going to the supermarket, the pharmacy or the hospital, or they would be charged or they would be arrested. Rahab did not feel safe at home. And many of us were told stay home. Of course, we wanna curtail the spread of the virus and we're at home and many of us feel safe at home but Rahab did not feel safe at home because Rahab was looking to life she was looking forward to life on the other side of the crisis she knew that there was more beyond what was happening right now beyond her present circumstances beyond the quarantine and beyond the stay at home instructions Rahab was looking for something more so while everyone was looking to protect themselves, while everyone was looking to protect their families, while everyone was looking to stay within the walls of Jericho because they felt safe in the quarantine and the lockdown, thinking that Israel could not touch them, Rahab was on a journey and her security, her only security was not in staying home, but in seeking God while she was at home. We're still talking about seeking God in crisis. In Jeremiah 29 verse 13, the Bible actually says, you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. And when we look at Rahab's situation, we look at Rahab in the midst of a crisis, seeking God with all of her heart. It seemed to be the mission that she was on. One of the things that we can also learn from it, the second thing, is that Rahab was seeking a personal relationship with God, the God that she had heard about for all these years. That is why she deliberately put her life at risk. She risked being accused of treason because she wanted to know the God. She was seeking after the God that was bigger than the crisis. She was seeking after the God that was bigger than the quarantine, the God that was bigger than the fear that was within the walls of Jericho. Rahab made a conscious choice to choose to seek God, the God of the Israelites, based on the facts that she had heard about him. And she responded in faith, which is essentially a belief that pushes one to action. So Rahab had heard about the God of the Israelites. We may, not, we may not have looked at her in that light, but she had heard about him like everybody else. But now she was taking action. She received the spies, and we'll see more about that later as we go on. But she responded in faith because her faith pushed her to act. And how do we know that? In Joshua chapter 2, 9 to 13, Rahab repeats a secondhand testimony. She says to these two spies, I know, I did not just hear, but I know you could go to it yourself, read it from the Bible yourself, 
in Joshua chapter 2, 9 to 13, she said, I know that the Lord has given you this land and great fear has fallen on us. So all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. We have heard how the Lord dried up the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to Sihon and Og, the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan, whom you completely destroyed. When we heard it, our hearts melted in fear and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven. This is Rahab speaking to the spies. The Lord your God is God in heaven above and on the earth below. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that you will show kindness. Please swear to me by that same God, the God who did all of that amazing stuff for the children of Israel, swear to me by him, that God, the same God, the God that is big. She knew that he was that big God. She says, please swear to me by that same God that you will show kindness to me and my family because I have shown kindness to you. And that is when she asked them for a sign that would spare the lives of her father, her mother, her brothers and sisters and all who belong to them and that you will save us from death. It is evident. Or it's, it is the evidence of, of faith of people like Moses and Joshua that sets the stage for Rahab to act toward her salvation and the salvation of her family. And I might I submit that while many of us right now, in the midst of this global pandemic and in the midst of the crisis, many of us are cursing the darkness. We curse the quarantine, we curse the shutdown, we curse the virus. It is probably one of the best things that may have happened to us because on the other side of this COVID-19, many of us will probably live more intentional lives, a more purposeful life, a life filled with more gratitude, a life that is more strategic in how we share our faith with others. Because if Corona did anything, apart from the damage that it did of taking many lives, it allowed the world to get a break from the hustle and bustle and give the climate time to breathe again. It also taught us how fragile life can be. It has taught us that life as we know it can literally change overnight because we went into 2020 excited. In fact, I mean, 10, 15 years ago, everybody was looking at 2020 vision. Everybody looked toward 2020 as a year that was going to be this amazing year and boom, out of nowhere, COVID-19, our lives change overnight. But one of the things it taught us too is that death is no respecter of person. So we've lost loved ones and it's painful, but everything else about this entire situation is teaching us some serious lessons about life and about how much we probably have taken for granted for so long. I am sure the people who lived through and came out on the other side of the 1918 Spanish flu can testify that they did not do life as usual after the Spanish flu. I am sure they lived differently after that. Just watching or knowing and hearing that 500 million people had been infected and about 30 to 50 million globally had died in less than two years. That's more than all the soldiers and civilians killed during World War I combined. All that happened in one pandemic. I am sure it could have not been easy for them emotionally, psychologically, physically, mentally, and even spiritually but I cannot imagine them living the same afterwards. I can't imagine the anxiety that they were going through, the fear and the tears for those who lo lost their loved ones, the psychological uncertainty of whether I would be one of these 500 million who contracted the flu or one of the 30 to 50 million who died. The spiritual questionings that some would have had of where is God when a pandemic strikes, I can only imagine. But on the other side of the Spanish flu, I am certain that there were men and women grateful that the angel of death had passed over them and life, they knew that their life surely could never be the same again. They had to adjust to their new normal, much like we are doing right now. But life could have never been the same as it was before. One of the third things that we can learn from the story of Rahab and from the fact that she was seeking God in the middle of a crisis 
is that Rahab gave, that God gave Rahab wisdom to act. Rahab had been seeking God. That is why she received the spies and she didn't give them up. This was her moment in time, her moment in history to act on the faith that she was developing behind the Jericho walls. It was her moment to act on faith. That moment for Rahab had come. Her moment to meet God and the children of Israel had come. It may seem like coincidence that these men went to Rahab's house of all the places in Jericho that they could have gone. But God, knowing the heart of Rahab, knowing that Rahab, like everybody else, had heard about him and feared. But the difference was Rahab's heart was seeking to know that God that she had heard about for her own self. That is why I personally believe that God allowed the spies to not only go scout the land, but to go to Rahab's house because he was meeting Rahab where she was physically and literally <laughs> because she was seeking after him and searching for him with all of her heart. We're talking about seeking God in crisis. Rahab was in a crisis, but she was looking out to meet the God of the Israelites. In Joshua chapter 2, 12 to 21, the Bible tells us that the spies made that covenant by giving Rahab that scarlet thread. That scarlet thread that was hung outside her home, that scarlet thread was the promise. If I see the thread, we will not destroy you when we come. If I see the thread, everyone who is in this house will be saved. That scarlet thread continues to represent the blood of Jesus. It runs through Jesus from Adam's first sacrifice until Jesus comes, until the last person is born on planet Earth. That scarlet thread is a thread of forgiveness of our sins. It's a scarlet thread of our deliverance from our past. The scarlet thread has the power to wash each of us and give us a new start because it did that for Rahab as well. It reminds me of the experience that the children of Israel had while they were in bondage in Egypt and the plagues were coming one after another because the angel of death had instructed them, if you put the blood on the doorpost of your house, it will serve as a sign marking that your house should be covered. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. The plague of death will not touch you. It will not strike you. You see, Rahab knew that if she held on to that God that she was seeking, that God that she wanted to find, she knew that if she held on to God, that God that she wanted so much, that her life would never be the same again on the other side of the crisis. She knew that when God saved her and her family, she would have a new normal on the other side of the takedown of the wall of Jericho. She knew that she would, ne she would have had a new normal, a new profession, a new calling, a new purpose. She would be a new woman, a woman living so intentionally that she got married. So she was now a married woman. She had, I'm not suggesting that that gave her more status, but I'm saying she was a woman of substance, a woman of value. And can you imagine that everybody else who could have pointed a finger at Rahab to say to her husband, Salman, that you cannot marry this woman because this was her profession. Every single one of them was dead. And everybody who was alive was alive as a result of Rahab's packed with the men of God. They were alive as a result of Rahab's personal evangelism to them. You see, because Rahab, in order for her to have convinced her family to come to her house, to be saved, that we all know that the God of the Israelites are so powerful. But trust me, I tell you, I, I have been seeking after that God and I met with the men of Israel. And I'm telling you, if you come to my house, you'll be saved. Her family had to have believed that that God was so powerful that he would save them and that the pact that Rahab made was going to come to pass for her to be able to get every single one of them to come to her home. And so none of the people that could have pointed a finger at her, because you know us, you know how we are Seventh-day Adventists. A lot of times we like to refer to people by their past. The person did this thing 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago. And every time we speak about them, oh, yes, that cheater. Oh, yes, that thief. Oh, yes, that. So I could imagine these people 
who would have tried to accuse Rahab were all gone, all dead, and the only ones alive were the ones for which she would have made some kind of pact. She made a commitment with these people, so she had to personally evangelize and convince them and they would have had to believe as well based on her personal conviction that God that same God of Israel was powerful enough because Rahab did not just sit down and hear about the God of the Israelites but she was convinced that that God of the Israelites was powerful enough to save me and I want to know that God she knew that Jericho was going to be destroyed but she wanted God more than anything else and so when everything was said and over, when everything was done, when the walls of Jericho had fallen down, Rahab had no accusers. It reminds me of the woman who was caught in adultery. And when she met Jesus, after she met him and she had encountered him and, and the accusers were there and they were saying, oh, this woman was caught in adultery. And Jesus just went down nicely and he began to write in the sand. And then when he looked up, they were gone and he said, woman, where are your accusers? And she said, um, I have none. He said, well, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. You see, the thing is, Rahab had been seeking God in the middle of a crisis. She was seeking him in the middle of a crisis. And why did Jesus tell that woman who was caught in adultery, go and sin no more? He said, I don't condemn you. I did not come to condemn sinners like you. In fact, I came to give you life and to give it to you more abundantly. God was giving Rahab a new life, an abundant life, a meaningful life, an impactful life, a life that was rooted in purpose because Rahab, after seeking God and finding him, had to go and sin no more. So that's why after Jericho was destroyed, she takes up her rightful place. She falls in line with her destined divine and true purpose. She takes up her real position as a daughter of the king. That's who she was. That's who she was born to be. She goes from prostitute to princess, all because she was seeking God in the middle of a crisis and found it. So after the crisis, Rahab's destiny and destination as a woman was changed because her purpose had been changed. Her purpose was restored. Her purpose was transformed. And Rahab's simple secret was seeking God in the midst of a crisis. And one of the amazing things I love about her story is she makes it not to the Hollywood Stars Boulevard, not to the Grammys or the Oscars. She makes it to the Hall of Faith. In, in Hebrews 11, 31, the Bible says, by faith, Rahab perished not with them that believed not when she received the spies in peace. So you understand why I say when Rahab received these spies, it was an act of the belief that she already had in God. And it was her moment to be able to make her, her, her commitment or her connection there. So she perished not with them that believed not because everybody had heard according to what we read there in Joshua chapter two, nine to 13, everyone had heard and they were fearful, but she was not fearful. She actually acted on her faith instead. And so when she received the spies, she had already acted in faith. That's why she makes it to the hall of faith. Not only does she make it to the hall of faith, she makes it to the lineage of Jesus. Because in Matthew chapter 1, we're told that she marries Salmon, Salmon the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab, Boaz the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth, Obed was the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of King David. So we see her marrying Salmon, giving birth to Boaz, Boaz marries Ruth, the Moabite woman, and gives birth to Obed. Obed and his wife have a son named Jesse. Jesse has a son named David, and there we see the woman who was seeking God in the midst of a crisis and found him, finds herself in the greatest family ever, being the great-grandmother of King David. The lineage to reach the Messiah, Jesus, our Savior of the world, comes. So after Jericho, 
was destroyed. Rahab got that new start, that scarlet thread that represents that forgiveness and the blood of Jesus. She receives her new start because everybody was dead. The scarlet thread provided her with that new start, not the woman who was a sinner, not the heart inside the walls of Jericho, but the woman who was saved because she was not afraid to act on her faith. She first believed when she received the spies, when she had heard about Jesus actually, she, she believed on that God and the power of that God. She acted on her faith when she received the spies, et cetera, et cetera. And that is why, on a side note, I take great offense when I see us consistently depicting Rahab as a harlot. When we see the woman's life was changed, the woman was almost a, an, a savior to her family and everything and the Lord. And she's mentioned there and she will never not be mentioned when we speak about Jesus because she's in that family, she's in that lineage and so on. So we see there, Rahab after the crisis, I believe for us, like her, if we spend time seeking God during this crisis, recognizing that so many of us were so busy and always hurried and never had enough time to pray, we were always in a hurry, going off to work and going off to do this, and we would, could all testify that the time has never been enough if you're busy. Some of us may be doing nothing, but for those of us who are busy, you can testify that sometimes it's just not enough time. But this corona by a virus, that crisis, the, the pandemic has forced many of us to slow down, many of us to be at home when we would rather be at work. Some of us are saying, you know, I wish I could do this, I could do that, but now you have the time. We've had, what, nine months to be able to do things that we were never able to do before. But now we have the time to continue to seek God in prayer, to spend more time in prayer. Because if you're working from home, nothing prevents you from spending an hour just talking to your father and connecting with him. We have been gifted with time, something that many of us always wish we had. I know for those of us who are busy, COVID got us busier. I can tell you that. There were so many goals that I wanted to accomplish this year. I wasn't able to do it because I got so busy doing so many other things. All of it, still good stuff. But the point is we have been gifted with time, time to make dreams a reality because now you can do it with, with no excuse. You don't have to run to our office. Some people are working and we praise God for those who are going out there. But the point is after this crisis, many of us will never be the same again and rather none of us should be the same again. Because for some, it may be for a little while, which is sad for some of us, you know, life might look a little different for us and maybe when we get a custom again we might get back to it but i could almost imagine when it is declared officially because some churches are opened right now still have number restrictions etc but when it is declared safe to go out to churches i am sure pastor burns i am almost sure the church might be packed if not for the gospel's sake but for the fact that we can now socialize for the simple freedom of knowing that I could actually go to church. The thing I used to take for granted. I saw somebody posted from my old church back home in St. Lucia saying that they were on a long line. Everybody's temperature were being checked before they go into the sanctuary and they were be given san hand sanitizers, etc. And they said when they counted 100, the doors of the church were shut. But I could imagine we would be rushing into the churchyard to be one of those counted to get inside. The things we took for granted are the things that we are now desiring even more because we saw overnight how quick a crisis can change our so-called normalities. I can imagine many of us sitting in our vehicles waiting for the church doors to open at 9 a.m. Nobody has to send a text. Nobody has to send an email begging us to come to Sabbath school. Sabbath school will finally be filled to capacity because many who had never been there for years now see the relevance in coming because they saw how quickly the freedom to congregate can be taken away. Those who, did, who could not wait to leave the church grounds to go home and not return to AY or Bible study will probably wish that the Sabbath day would not come to an end because they experience how quickly everything can change, how quickly one virus, whether it came through the consumption of unclean meats, construction of human hands, whatever it is, it changed our reality overnight. So my question is to you, what are you using this crisis time to do? What are you using this quarantine to do? What are you using the lockdown to do? Are you spending time seeking God above everything else and find him 
if you know that you know him, because some of us have heard about him, like the people in Jericho, many of us go to church, but we don't have that personal relationship. When we were there at your church before, and we spoke about the, in the week of prayer, we spoke about prayer as a personal relationship with God, not just a knowledge of him, but a personal relationship with him. Are you spending time? getting to know him more are you deepening your relationship with him what are you doing or are you spending time thinking about the future and fearing for the future like the people within the walls of jericho were doing or are you spending time with him to deepen your relationship with him during this crisis are you earnestly seeking to negotiate your salvation and the salvation of your loved ones your neighbors your friends at this time Jeremiah 29, 13, I mentioned earlier, says, you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. This is not a time for us to just come on Zoom to church. It's not good enough. We did that in the walls of our churches. We would go there. This is a time for us to be seeking after God in prayer. Because the only way that we can seek him is through prayer. That's the only way that we can establish relationship with him. Are we spending time building our relationship, deepening our relationship, developing our relationship for those of us who are still struggling there? Are we spending time in prayer? Are we making prayer a top priority? Because prayer is a conversation with God. Prayer is the way. And for those of you who had bought the books before and stuff, and those of you in the prayer class, you would have seen we went deep into that about developing that personal relationship with him. Having that conversation, not a monologue, a dialogue. Are we using this crisis time? Are we using this quarantine time? Are we using this time of restrictions in how we do things? Because within our homes, we can meet with him anytime and anywhere. Are we using our time wisely? Rahab was not content to be saved alone. She used the time of crisis to seek after God, to find him, to negotiate her salvation, evangelize to her family so that they too would believe in the one true God. My desire for us is that our prayer focus would be that God would give us a desire to seek after him during this time more than we do anything else, more than we do a job, more than we do money, more than we do anything else, but seeking after him with all of our hearts, because we will find what we are looking for. Are you seeking God in the midst of this crisis? I look forward to seeing you. This afternoon, we're going to talk about a proven formula for your press success. You don't want to miss it. I look forward to seeing you then.